So let's turn to the text today. Ephesians chapter number two is where we'll head and spend our time today. Ephesians chapter number two. Uh, the book of Ephesians is a letter that is often attributed to the Apostle Paul. Probably it is more accurate uh, to assert or attribute the book of Ephesians to one of uh, Paul's um, mentees or a community of people <coughs> who Paul uh, was preaching to consistently in Ephesus, and they capture some of Paul's greatest hits, if you will. The book of Ephesians is one of these Bible, one of these these books. If if you read through it, you you find every one of Paul's greatest theological concepts are summarized in this book. It, I keep saying book in this, yeah, book, yeah, book of Ephesians. Okay, it's been a long night, amen. Um, and so, no, it's been a short night because we lost the hour. That's what's going on. I'm sleep deprived up in this joint. All right. Y'all pray for me. Amen. That, that I don't fail. Uh, so, so, so if Ephesians is uh, one of these books of, of the New Testament, the Christian scriptures that give us some of Paul's greatest hits, his greatest theological concepts summarized against the backdrop of one of the most diverse and uh, uh, polytheistic cultures uh, in the Roman Empire. Um, but what is of particular in interest for me and us, I hope today, is this idea that uh, Ephesus was known for its creations. It was known for the, the, the great works of art that it pulled together. It was known for all the many um, um, fine uh, masterpieces, uh, uh, expensive uh, tapestry, clothing, um, art. It, it was just a, a deeply culturally rich art space. And, uh, and I love how, as we read this passage, Paul plays in on this, uh, this, this, this cultural relevance, which reminds me and hopefully uh, affirms all of us that the gospel when preached and lived well will always deeply inform and, dare I say, expose the great possibility of God's activity among us. That God's work is not above us. Amen. God's work is among us. And you ought to be happy about God's work being among you. Mm -hmm. Because if God's work was too far beyond you, how I many know none of us would have a inkling that God was ever at work? And if you don't think God is at work, you can easily fall into despair and uh, pessimism and all these other uh, uh, great, uh, you know, words that describe hopelessness. And uh, I often say hopelessness is as deadly as a bullet. And so you can't be hopeless. Amen. We got to remain hopeful. That's not my sermon today, but pat yourself on the chest and say, I must remain hopeful. I must remain hopeful. All right. Here we go. Of chapter number uh, two, verse number seven. The words of the scripture says, and I'm reading from the message. Now God has us where God wants us with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. One day I'm going to preach a sermon on time. I won't do it today, but, uh, you know, the great thing about being a people of eternity is that we will never run out of time. Mm. I gotta, I'm going to preach that one day. Uh, not today. Okay, saving is all God's idea in all God's work. All we do is trust God enough to let God do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd go around bragging that we done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. Woo. Some good stuff. God creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join God in the work God does. The work God has gotten ready for us to do, the work we had better be doing. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk from the topic today, you are a piece of work. 
If you've been at the way long enough, this title's not new to you. Sometimes you just got to go back and brush it off. But tell your neighbor, you are a piece of work. Amen. Father, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Don't tell them that. You ain't nothing. I know some of y'all been waiting all week to say that to somebody. So I'm going to give you one more chance. Amen. Then we're going to get back holy. But look, look across the room, make some eye contact with some folk. Amen. I'm just shake your head like you, you ain't nothing. Go ahead and tell them you ain't nothing but a piece of work. Just you ain't nothing. Uh-huh. This week has been a week of deep reflection uh, for me. And as I've been struggling with often these tug and pull impulses, these seemingly contradictory uh, but yet complementary ideas of idealism and pragmatism. You know, we are often, uh, you know, given these concepts that are great in theory. But when you try to live them out, you realize how human we all are. You know, we often can really reduce our deficiencies uh, as a negative without struggling with the reality that, you know, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This falling short of the glory of God, I like to often describe as human weakness. That even with our best efforts, we are often not able to reach these ideals we purport. Now, on one hand, it is, you know, an important way for you and I to remain humble because often if you lose sight of your human weakness, you become quite judgmental about other folks' human weaknesses. But on the other hand, we can't just chalk it all up to human weakness and act as if we have no responsibility to do the work, necessary work, to become more conformed to the image of Jesus, which is indeed one of the purposes of salvation. It's not just to save you for the hereafter, but it's also to save you for the now. It is to make our lives much more compatible with the purposes of God. And so struggling with the knowing what I know to do, the doing what I should be doing, and the being, how am I to exist? Struggling with the knowing, the being, and the doing, for me are often hard to reconcile when I look at all the foolishness in the world. You know, we had to go up to Sacramento, Jeff Sessions, you know, the uh, attorney general or or renegade, whichever one you want to call him, you know, sued the state of California because we, the people, decided we wanted to have a sanctuary state. And it is not the case, amen, that everybody in California wanted a sanctuary state, but we all organized, praise God, and we all testified and marched in the streets and made sure elected officials heard our voices, and they made the state of California sanctuary state, and Sessions comes into town and says he's going to sue the state of California. So when I heard and we heard he was coming, you know, we said, well, we must go meet Jeff Sessions. <laughs> Amen. And, and as we got out there to do, you know, our, our acts of, of, of protest and, 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 and civil disobedience, et cetera, it just reminded me uh, that there is always dissonance between the knowing, the doing, and the being. Because, you know, there are some moments when we are out, you know, trying to bear witness in public spaces that my righteous indignation can morph into (laughs) anger, sometimes violent anger, retributive anger, you know, y'all know, you know, anger. Amen. Not the not the holy anger, the unholy anger. 
And there's a struggle, because, you know, I'd be out there just hollering and screaming, and, you know, we'd be taking the streets, and then when people want to, like, try to run you over, you got to, like, try not to, like, you know, knock somebody out, praise God, because we know that's probably not going to help that much, but it will make you feel better. <laughs> In the short term, of course, because, you know, when you go to jail, then you don't feel that good about it all. It's like, dang, I should let them go. The knowing, the doing, and the being. And then, of course, uh, you know, the way in which all this is unleashing these ice raids all across the state. Uh, I was talking to uh, uh, some friends uh, of ours down in Los Angeles, and, and one of their uh, comrades, uh, members of their church and whatnot, or extended member of their church, was sitting in a coffee shop. She's a, a sister from uh, um, Africa. I think she's either from Nigeria or the Congo. I can't remember which one. She was sitting in a coffee shop. She's here as an artist on a on a on a artist visa, and and I swept in and arrested her right out the coffee shop two weeks before Christmas, and nobody knew where she was. And she finally remembered. Uh, to call, uh, you know, our, our extended family member, and our extended family didn't know what to do, and so she called me, and, and I had to put her in touch with Baji, the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Now they're trying to work to get her out. She only needed $1,900 to be out, but she didn't know what to do because she didn't even know she was at risk, and her parents thought she had committed suicide. They hadn't heard from her since two weeks before Christmas. And it just makes me always struggle with this reality that people, our lives are so at risk in a country that has these ideals that we say we pledge allegiance to, but we can't seem to realize. I was talking to another comrade, one of our loved ones in Detroit. Uh, told me about uh, Siwatu Salama Ra, whose 26-year-old pregnant mother sentenced to two years in prison because uh, she was uh, being, uh, some folks were trying to run her down, her neighbor was trying to run her down with her child, and she pulled out an unloaded gun and was trying to use it to, you know, get them to leave her alone. And, and, and she, she, she said this comment in, in court that the prosecutor convinced the jury. This is her talking to the judge at her sentencing hearing. The prosecutor convinced the jury and the judge that I lacked fear, and that's not true. I was so afraid, especially for my toddler and as a mother, and I don't believe that the jury could imagine a black woman being scared, only being mad. And the judge heard her speak that articulately, and they still sentenced her to two years in prison. So we're working to try to get her home because she is one of these uh, folks that we work with around justice and ending violence. And, 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 and so it, it, it often can feel like we are really trying to, to do the work of God in the world, and still our ideals are always being sabotaged by the pragmatism of the moment. And I want to believe that as you and I get closer and closer to uh, Passion Sunday, Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday, and Easter, that the season of Lent is clarifying how all of these seemingly contradictory impulses require a certain kind of resolve by the people of God. You and I cannot move through life as followers of Jesus with a willy-nilly kind of sensibility of who we are and what we are called to do. Because our ideals will often find themselves under consistent attack by the situations we are often struggling to resolve daily. I want you to just imagine what it took for Jesus to create a new world, this new kingdom that Luke talks about, the peaceable kingdom, that Jesus is breaking in a new kingdom, a new way of life that isn't just about how your soul exists in eternity, but also about how our bodies exist in creation. There is a braiding of sorts of how your life here will be an extension into eternal existence. You don't just start being saved when you get to heaven. 
But the trajectory of salvation begins now. I know it's early. I mean, y'all look sleep deprived too. Amen. I hope I'm not. Amen. Amen. Salvation don't start when you get to heaven. Salvation starts for you now, but how many know the process of salvation started with God a long time ago? Uh, this ain't God ain't no new God ain't no spring chicken, as they say. Amen. God didn't just get here. You got here just a few minutes ago. But how many know God's been around a little while? And God's plan has been around a little while. And I am convinced that when we really look at what Jesus had to endure, what Jesus had to wrestle with, what Jesus had to accept, and what he had to reject, what Jesus had to make sense of, what he eventually had to surrender to, just to be faithful to what he was called to create, when we make sense of that, or at least wrestle with all of that, it will catalyze within us a passion and desire for a new way of living, a new way of being, hopefully a, a voracious appetite for knowing and learning. So as when you hear the stories that I've just mentioned to open up this sermon today, you don't dismiss those stories as somebody else's problem. But you leave here wrestling with your own struggle and realize that other struggle is almost as, uh, or not almost, other struggle is bound up with your struggle. And that struggling towards God's purpose is indeed the call for every child of God. You can't be a child of God and just be walking through life struggle free. I know some, that's what some of us want, especially you know, that's how it was marketed to us. Come to Jesus and, and you get three wishes, right? You want that genie. You, you rub that, that, that thing and, and a genie come out. What's your first wish? I want a boo. All right, so you get your boo. What's your second wish? I want a house. And you get your house. What's your third wish? I want a car. Or I want uh, whatever, whatever it is. And then that's the extent of your utility with God. Once you understand that God is not your genie. Man. God is trying to work on you. I wish I had a church in here that understood that God is trying to work. And understand that God's working on us. God's working on us is, 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 is creating you into something more faithful. You see, often we struggle with this, uh, this, this notion of salvation as piety. When I think salvation as faithfulness must be deeply explored all the more in the moment we're living in. Because if we are honest, we can get real selective about piety. You know, piety, you know, you know, what you're supposed to do, you know, your long list of do's and don'ts, you know, your, the sins. You know, usually when we start talking about sin, our, 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 our proclivity, our, our human tendency is to focus on the sins we don't struggle with. And then, you know, we real rigid about that. Ooh, don't you dare do this. Don't you dare. You stop, puff, puff, puff. You, you don't, don't, that's a sinny sin, sin, and don't you dare. And then when you start getting to your stuff, you get quiet as a mouse. You just. <laughs> what happened was, you know, I was, I was just, <clears throat> just, you know, grace, grace. What about grace? <laughs> I wish. So, so, so we, we, I'm not throwing out piety, but I'm trying to explain or express that salvation as piety alone is a sinister project. Because when the selectivity of piety is grounded in the power of who gets to decide what is pious, right? then all of us can be in a world of trouble. It doesn't mean that, you know, there aren't some kind of basic uh, declarations in Scripture that offer to you and I a sense of what 
and how we should live and act. But I want you to continue to appreciate that as you journey through the whole of scripture, we constantly see the braiding of personal piety or right behavior with the notion of corporate piety or justice. And so depending on who the characters are or what the social condition was, the scriptures were always about calling people back into right relationship with God and one another based on the breakdown. When social relationships break down, then you and I realize that our personal behavior is actually disrupting the social fabric. It is not piety in the sense that it's just me and God and nobody else and what I do does not have an impact on anyone else, but it is also reality that I can't just walk through life radically individualized and lose sight of the truth that Dr. King says we are all tied in an inescapable web of mutuality and what affects one of us directly affects all of us indirectly and so i i when i was in seminary i i i heard about this these kind of notions and i i, I don't know if uh, i think i got it from oh i can't remember who I, uh, 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 professor Hor horzog and he talked about theopraxis and and i i like to define it right belief plus faithful actions catalyze just societies all right right belief what you believe rightly, particularly about God, Theo, plus faithful actions, how you act faithfully based off of your belief, praxis, creates just societies. And we are called in this moment, God is working on us to be more faithful in our praxis that are a reflection of what we believe about God and what God is doing. Here in America, we can get stuck in the rut of either right belief and then argue incessantly about theological propositions with very little focus or concern about the application of real lives. Or we can be obsessed with faithful actions with no consciousness of how they reflect or are informed by what we do or don't believe about God. Or we can be consumed with just society and not appreciate that as a follower of Jesus, we must hold it all in tension with one another. Because Jesus came to create a new kingdom, a new way of life. And I was reading the New York Times op-ed. I was exploring the quiet exodus of blacks and other people of color leaving white evangelical churches. It was such a deeply fascinating and troubling read that exposed why we must interrogate how being faithful is just as important as being pious. The pastor described his own journey and that of the congregation, and I'm just gonna read it because, you know, I think it's worthy of some quick reflection. I know we ain't got a lot of time, amen? But th this is what the pastor says. He's, the pastor says, I wasn't wrestling, speaking of his feelings in 2016, um, and he was going on to explain that he was not wrestling now. I wasn't wrestling then, I wasn't, and I'm not wrestling now either. We were electing what we felt was the person who held the values that the church loves dearly the most. That doesn't mean that he, talking about Trump, is perfect, but I do believe after spending some time with him, I, he must be talking about Trump and not Jesus, because this is, I don't know, <laughs> the him is very ambiguous, but the context makes me think he must be talking about Trump. Spending time with Trump, that Trump really wants to learn. Yes, he's talking about Trump. And that he really wants to do a good job for all Americans. I really do. This is what he believes. There are larger racial injustices in the country, he said, and those injustices need to be fixed, though not in ways that would enable dependence, he clarified, but rather to give people a hand up, not a hand out. He noted the low black unemployment rate under Mr. Trump. Then he says the answer to racism lies primarily in the church, not the government. And now that white pastors are waking up to the pain that black people have felt, it is in many ways a hopeful time, unquote. Thank God that these pastors are waking up <coughs> to uh, the pain that we feel. I guess that's the takeaway from the article. I have so many questions with this analysis that I could preach a sermon on it all by myself. 
I mean, why weren't you wrestling then? And why aren't you wrestling now? Why is it so hard to acknowledge y'all messed up? I mean, you just got it wrong. What is at the root of such denial? How can a follower of Jesus project any solution to injustice and in the same breath dismiss dependence and interdependence as the way forward toward a more just society? And in fixing racism, these are some of my questions, just in a quick, t you know, quick read. I didn't spend too much time with it because, you know, I, I was struggling with my, my righteous indignation. And my anger. But this is one something I pulled out. If fixing racism is the responsibility of the church and not the government, when are y'all gonna get get it get it right? And stop fixating on diabolical notions of racial reconciliation, which keep intact white male power devoid of justice. Just some ruminations. Now, make no mistake. As we journey to Lent, it is always so much easier to focus on the evil beyond us or outside of us that we don't care to look at how we are less faithful as well. And so while this article, you know, I read the article to give you a sense of the problem, because I think some of y'all latched on to some of the problems of his thinking, you know, it's a tool also to get you and I ready to think of some of the ways we are less faithful. Because if you cannot see how less faithful you are as a follower of Jesus, then you cannot become the piece of work that God wants to create out of your life. Because in that inability to see your own growing edges, you have shut God out of making you better. God wants to make all of us better. Not better in the sense of more comfortable, because that's what some of us want. It will get better. Hey! Come on, he's like, yes, God, make me better. <laughs> then when God starts making you better, you're like, no, God. <laughs> nah, nah, that's not what I want. I don't want that. I'm cool just how I am. You ever told God that? God, I'm cool. This is why I thought I wanted, but I'm cool. Just, you know, God, I just give me some more time. That, that's just me. I, I think I pray at least once or twice a day. Pat yourself on the chest say, we are a piece of work. We are a piece of work. Uh, so let me run through these points, and then we're going we to try, try, try to close here. The first way that God, I think, creates you and I as pieces of work that are more faithful is we must be reminded that we are created by God. Somebody say, I am created by God. Now, this idea that we are created by God, I think the scripture that we use says God does both the making and the saving. Now, you know, if I could preach the whole first part of this chapter, it would talk about how you used to be dead in your sins and trespasses, but God, right, through God's grace and mercy, you know, saved you and elevated you, that, that all that you are is a reflection of God creating and making you Listen, when God created at the beginning, God looked at everything that God created, stepped back and said, this is good stuff. Now, the problem with the world, particularly in this fallen state, is that, number one, we often forget that we are created good, but we are not created perfect. So there is a struggle between goodness and perfection. Theologically, when we start talking about the ways, ooh, I feel good. I mean, I feel like I might have to preach a little bit. Theology, we start talking about goodness versus perfection. You know, I, I love the Wesleyan theological notion of salvation because it talks about justification, sanctification, and glorification. And in the, the, the theological framework of Wesleyan holiness, Pentecostalism, which I and by extension some of you, praise God, are a part of, we wrestle with this idea that God God justifies us, meaning God says you are good. 
no, no conditions. The work of Jesus on the cross reaffirms that you are saved, you are good, that, that there is inherent dignity and goodness that is associated with you, and it is not conditional. We are all created in the image of God, Imago Dei. It is an inherent goodness that God don't, my, we used to say, uh, I know I'm somebody because God don't create no junk. This used to be a, a bumper sticker that we used to say all the time in our Sunday school class. I know I'm somebody. It was all the kids, I know I'm somebody. Because God don't create no junk. Because God don't create no junk. Now, you know that had a stick in my mind. I ain't you know, seen or heard that in like 30 years, maybe even more. But think about this idea that you work from a premise that God created you good. Martin Luther King Jr.'s got this, well, he don't got it out. Some other folks who wrote this great uh, set of essays on the political philosophy of Martin Luther King Jr., and they were pulling and teasing out Du Bois' uh, 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 argument that Du Bois and, and uh, 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 Booker T. were having. They were having an argument, and they were talking about, uh, is dignity at the key or at the foundation or the root of the pathway towards liberation? Meaning that, must we maintain our dignity at all cost on our journey to liberation lest we lose ourselves as we get free? And I found this to be deeply compelling, right? Because as you and I are being saved, perfected, you must maintain your belief and conviction that you are good. Even with all your idiosyncrasies and conundrums and all of your deficiencies and growing edges, you are still good. That God looks at you and sees the inherent goodness in you. And because God sees the goodness in you, you must learn to find the goodness in other people. So I may not agree with all of what you're saying or doing, but I got to make sure that my anger that may be justified by my treatment or how I'm being treated does not override the call to still see you as human, created in the image of God. That's hard, especially when it's folk you don't like. How many of it's easy to love folk you know? Well, sometimes. Easier. <laughs> it's easier to love folk that you in agreement with, that you know. But when you don't know folk and you've been pumped with a whole lot of uh, half-truths about folk, it becomes harder. And so goodness versus perfection means in the sanctification kind of theological framework of the Wesleyans, I like that sanctification is something that happens every day. Justification happens once in your life. Sanctification happens every day of your life. God is sanctifying us. God is making us better by transforming us Amen. into the image of God's likeness. God's not making you better by whispering in your ear that you don't have to change. <laughs> Some of us, they think that's what, oh, yes, God, tell me everything. Just yes, that's all I want to hear. You don't got to change. You don't got, yes, thank you, God. Thank you, God. No. How many know you can't be mean your whole life? Greedy your whole life. Uh, 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 unfaithful person your whole life. Promiscuous your whole life. Unhealthy your whole you, life. God's, got, God's trying to get you together. I knew them 10 claps, that was probably gonna be the limit of what I was gonna get out of this, this point. But it's still true, just the same. You can't be a piece of work and stay the same. You just can't. You just can't. God wants to make us more faithful. And so the first question that I want you to wrestle with, do you wrestle with goodness versus perfection? Are you wrestling with this notion that I am not good when in reality what you mean to say is I am not perfect? 
you should always wake up and look yourself in the mirror and say, I am good. Because God don't create no junk. It is a declaration of the dignity, inherent worth of you as a created being of God. Wrestling with goodness for a second. What is stripping away your inherent goodness? There are some things out here that are t telling you you're not good. Racial hierarchy, sexism, uh, homophobia, transphobia. They just list the list. Uh, 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 you know, you're not American, so people don't tell you you ain't good. You ain't got a lot of money, so you ain't good. You're not black. You're not white. You're not tall. You're not short. You're not skinny. You're not fat. You're not Baptist. You're not whatever. You're sitting there like, Lord, I'm just not good. No, the devil is a lie. You good. Inferior people create labels to exclude others based off of their insecurities. God is the most secure thing that ever happened. My God don't need your labels. Woo, I don't know where that came from, but that just spoke to me. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him I am good. Second thing the scripture says is that we are created for a purpose and a calling. Somebody say created for a purpose. Somebody else say we are intentional. You're a piece of work because, listen, your purpose is not up for grabs. Too often, too often, we believe that we get to pick our purpose. As a child of God, you don't get to pick. In what, this is what Sister Bree Newsom, when she was here a couple weeks ago and brought half of us to tears. I know I was over there crying and sniffling. She said, you know, I had my own plans, and then one day I got on my knees and I laid my plans on the altar, and I said, God, whatever you want to do with me, do it. Anybody ever had that moment in your walk with God? You said, God, this is what I want to do. Then you realize, if you haven't, that may be something you need to do before you die. I'm going to tell you you ain't do it today, but you know, the sooner you do it, the better. Get on your knees and say, God, these are my plans. But whatever you want to do, Jesus did it. Now, I know we say we follow Jesus, except when Jesus does things we don't want to do. <laughs> it's like, I follow Jesus until. All right, let's... So, 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 so listen, the, 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 the piece of work that God is trying to turn you into is beyond your until moments. I got to, I got to move fast because, because we, 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 we short on time. But, 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 but just, just think about this. Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane getting ready to be betrayed and crucified. And Jesus is having a real conversation with God. Jesus like, God, these your, these your people. Now, I didn't create these jokers. These so sinner dogs. No. Jesus, Jesus is like, what is going on? How did I end up here? I'm the one created for the foundation of the world. And I don't, don't want to do this. It's got to be another way, God. I done seen the crucifixion last week. It did not look pretty. I like my dark skin, my smooth dark skin. I like my Afro sheen. I, 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 like, I, I like how I am. I'm not trying to be tortured to death. Then Jesus says the operative word, nevertheless. Your purpose is when nevertheless meets your will versus God's will. Moving with intentionality, child of God, means, listen, that you and I have a purpose that God set aside before the foundations of the world. I know that sounds super hyperbolic, but I want you to understand that God has carved out a purpose for your life. And like my pastor used to tell me all the time, when purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. You got to know from a prescript, per, prescriptive point of view what your purpose is. God has prescribed a purpose for us. The we, 
the church, the body of Christ. And then within the church, the body of Christ, a purpose for you. God's purpose for the church is to show forth the praises of the one who called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. It is to bear witness of the peaceable kingdom of God. It is to pray and act in ways that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. It is to make disciples. It is to heal the sick and raise the dead. That is the purpose of the church. The church didn't write its own job description. God wrote it. It's prescriptive. And so if God wrote the job description for the church and you're a part of the church, guess what? God wrote your job description too. So you and I have to keep wrestling with what does it mean for us to move with intentionality and not be deterred. Uh, the question I want you to wrestle with on this point, are you being faithful to what God has prescribed you to do? Are you about that life? Are you about that purpose-driven life? That, that life that is prescribed by God? Or are you one of these folk whose theopraxis is accidental and not intentional? You want these people that you just stumbling by the grace of God into all the will of God. I'm just stumbling. Oop, I tripped up and did the will of God today. Hallelujah. I mean, no, God wants you to stop tripping. And God wants you to start walking with purpose and intentionality. Give your neighbor a high five, tell them stop tripping now. You better stop tripping. God wants you to walk with purpose. And then the final thing before we, we move on out of here, God has created you to do good works. Somebody say good works. Say it again, good works. Good works are a description of what you should be doing. How many know not all work is good work? Not all work reaffirms or reinscribes the dignity, the, the worth, and the value of God's activity in the world. And this is where the creating part of our work has to take on such a deeper description that reflects God's purposes. I don't want us to be a busybody church that is doing work but it can't be defined as good work can't be defined as work that is transforming us into the image of god good work justice mercy compassion should describe the good work you're doing man it, it says the good work god has gotten ready for us to do work we had better be doing God prescribes you a purpose, then God describes what your purpose better be. You know what it means, you know, your parent, you, you better stop. <laughs> it's not a lot of room for negotiation. <laughs> you, be, you, you better, my dad, my dad starts saying, son, you better, you better, you better. He, he said a few times, you, you better get it together. <laughs> he didn't have to say much more. I knew what he was talking about. He didn't have to say, you, you, better, you better stop putting your head in that oven while the heater, while, while the fire is burning or you're going to get burnt and I'm going to have to spank you and take you to the doctor. He didn't have to describe it with that kind of length. You better get it together. I knew exactly <laughs> what he meant. It was a universally applicable statement. You better get it together. God's talking to some of us today. We better get it together. What do you mean, God? You know what I mean. <laughs> you try to play dumb. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. That's when my dad would smack me. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. I, I, I just, just, I knew I, I'm not, no, we in new age, so, you know, we're not hitting nobody. I'm not advocating for violence, but I know I needed it. No, just wait. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You better, we better get it together. Get to work, the good work. That when described, it is described as faithful, holy, just, salvific, 
liberatory. Get it together. So we can be the piece of work. In the culture of the text, the masterpieces and the pieces of work evoked unsolicited praise from everyone who observed it. The praise was directed towards the work created, but eventually it was directed towards the one who created it. Our lives, as Sister D said earlier, our lives should engender a certain kind of unsolicited praise. As people observe our lives, they should be able to say, wow, you must be created by God. It should eventually redirect people to the salvific work that God is doing. Not so you can brag. Not so you can feel holier than thou. So people can, just by observing, Say that you must be a piece of work created to do God's purposes. Come on, stand to your feet, everybody. Let's let's covenant with God and with one another. Hallelujah. Grab the hand of someone. In the name of Jesus, thank you for making us a piece of work. A work that can show forth the praises of you who called us out of darkness and into this marvelous light. Bless every person that I'm touching. You know the needs, the struggles, the challenges in their life. You know, God, all the many ways that the enemy tries to chip away at their inherent goodness, tries to diminish their personhood. But God, you are the one who created us. And when he created us, he said, this is good. And you saw our growing edges and our human weakness, and you also said, I must sanctify you so you can be more faithful. So God, remind us of our goodness and make us more faithful. Make us be a people who are constantly aware of the intentionality of our life lived before you and in the world. May our purpose be driven by your declaration and not by our circumstance. And may the work we do, hallelujah, transform us, transform the world. And we'll say thank you, God. Lift those hands to the Lord. It's me, O Lord, and I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's not my mother, it's not my father, it's not my sister, nor is it my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. I need your love, I need your power, I need your healing, I need your forgiveness, I need your help. Because without you, God, I am failing, I'm falling short of your glory. So fill in the gap with your grace and mercy, and we'll say yes, Lord. We'll say, yes, Lord. We'll say, yes, Lord. Save me. Somebody say, save me, Lord. Heal me. Somebody say, heal me, Lord. Help me. Somebody say, help me, Lord. So I can be who you've called me to be. And we'll thank you, God. If you need prayer, come on, meet us really quickly at the altar. You may need to be saved. You may need to be healed. You may need to be delivered. You may need to be set free. But whatever you need, come and meet us right here at the altar. 
And let's pray together. Let's touch and agree that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think. If you need the power of God, come on and meet me at the altar. If you need the strength of God, come on and meet me at the altar. If you need God to remind you of your goodness, come on and meet me. If you need God to remind you that you are being made perfect, come on.